Welcome to Dospan 24-7 as we bring you our Monday night program here in New York, broadcast around the world. We want to thank Nohar Singh for making this platform available, to Devin Bisu, our technical specialist, and of course, to our sponsors who so willingly uh, contribute to the hosting of this program. We want to thank you, our audience, for being with us tonight um, in Guyana, in Trinidad, in the United States, and around the world. I know it's we are one hour here in the United States, in, in the Eastern Seaboard, we are seven o'clock, but it's eight o'clock in your time there in Guyana and Trinidad. This evening, we are very honored to have with us a very astute politician, one of the few politicians who have struggled throughout the years and God has blessed him that he's still with us. He's no stranger to us, former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Bastio Pandey. Mr. Pandey, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you, thank you very much. And of course, with me is my co-host, Dr. Euclid Rose. Dr. Rose, welcome. Thank you, Charles, and welcome, Mr. Pandey, to the program. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Mr. Pandey, um, you have outlived um, most of the politicians of your era. In Trinidad, you had Dr. Eric William, you had Ian R. Robinson, you had Mr. Patrick Manning. In Guyana, we had uh, Mr. Forbes Burnham, Dr. Chetty Jagan, and so on. Um, how was your uh, relationship with these gentlemen, and of course the wider Caribbean and Barbados in Jamaica and so on? How was your relationship with them in your days in politics? Before I answer you, let me tell you that there's a gentleman in Trinidad writing a book about me, and it's called The Last Man Standing. <laughs> That's a great yeah. heading. That's a great title. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I got along very well with all the prime ministers. And they're all very cordial, very kind, very courteous. We got along very well indeed. But I know when you were oh. um, when you were Minister of Foreign Affairs in Trinidad, and I believe you are in Guyana when Prime Minister Robinson uh, fired you from his cabinet. That must yeah. have been a very that must have been a very difficult period for you, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was because I had great hopes that um, we had embarked upon a program that you would unite the country, because. You see, it has been said before me, uh, a nation divided against itself cannot stand. And indeed, ours is a very divided nation, divided along racial lines, ethnic lines, class lines. And so it's very difficult to come to consensus on anything. And as as and you're so magnanimous, and I and I really have to give you credit because when you became prime minister, you made um, A and R Robinson the president of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Why did you do that? Well, because I do not have a spiteful bone in my body. That's and, very nice. And secondly, uh, he was actually frustrating the work of the cabinet. And I thought that one way to get rid of him was to make him president. <laughs> that's, that's a good strategy. Um, Mr. Pandey, before Dr. Rose comes on, I want to ask you this question. Um, as one of the, as you said, a lone standing politician in the Caribbean, of course in Guyana, we still have uh, Mr. Hamilton Green, we still have Mr. Isikoyana, so we still have some politicians of your era in Guyana. I'm not sure in Trinidad and in Barbados and in Jamaica who is still standing there. But do you believe that the Westminster model of governance is working? Not at all. As a matter of fact, it is the single most deleterious factor preventing nations like ours from advancing because once we are divided the way we are, we divide, first of all, our human resources. And our human resources are the most important resources in, have, in developing a nation. 
and it happens in Guyana, and it happens in Trinidad. And uh, the Westminster system for societies such as ours um, is a deleterious factor. It's preventing the progress of the country. I have been arguing in Trinidad for quite a long time for constitutional reform. And Mr. Pandey, what would you say in a country like Trinidad, in a country like Guyana, I'm um, in a country like Mauritius, in a country where there is different great ethnic group that make up the population. In Guyana, we have the two major groups, like in Trinidad, in Mauritius, they have a similar situation, but now with the same ethnic group. In Singapore, they had this, they had the same issue, but they've been able to, you know, work work around it. What will be your strategy if you were if you were to give the politicians of Trinidad and of Guyana the way forward, what will be that part? Have a constitution that has built in the separation of powers, the separation of powers between the legislature and the executive. The legislature must be to pass laws and they must not be the ones. You see, what we have in Trinidad and Tobago is we have a parliament the majority forms the government. They are the sole ones who have the power to distribute the money, and they have the power to determine how it is being spent. The result is an enormous amount of corruption, waste, and mismanagement. You have to separate the powers of the legislative from the executive. And once you do that, and have one watching over the other, you are likely to have less corruption and less mismanagement. And in your, in your um, experience, which country have that um, model of government? I know the United States have that, but again, the majority <laughs> party controls, right? As we see, speak now, sure. the Democrat sure. controlled the House and the Senate and the presidency. So it's a one party I, rule. I think it is dangerous to look at other countries to form your own constitution. Your own constitution must be in accordance with your historical antecedents, with your composition of your race and the composition of your country. It must be unique to you. Um, and therefore, we may get ideas from other constitutions, but the most important thing would be to have a constitution that is relevant to the achievement of the hopes and aspirations of these particular people. That's how I look at constitutional reform. So you're saying that the member of parliament should not be ministers of government. Is that part of it? That's correct. So That's the, correct. The member of whether, parliament should... Sorry. Sorry, go on, go on, sorry. Uh, the members of parliament should be to pass law. And then we, we must set up another body to execute the plans for development of the country. The government supplies the money and the government monitors what the executive is doing. You have to have the separation of powers. That is the basic fundamental necessity for progress of countries like ours. So, and whether we are doing a uh constituent election like Trinidad has or a proportional representation like Guyana has, it does, that does, that's, that's not the, the, the matter right now. The, the idea is, as you're suggesting, we have a parliament that is independent of the government. Is that what you're, you're, you're recommending? No, no, no. Uh, no, no. What I'm recommending is that the parliament concerns itself was passing laws. There must be another election for the election of an executive. And the, exec the government will apportion the money and the ex executive will spend it and the parliament will be looking at them from day to day to ensure that there's uh, little or no corruption, waste and mismanagement. That is what is needed in societies like ours. You, you in, in Ghana almost got it right with the proportional representation and so on. But 
The one thing that is missing is the separation of powers between the legislature and the executive. Once the legislature has power to allocate money to itself and spend it by itself, you're in trouble. Okay, so now Guyana is most likely the, the, this new government, the President Irfan Ali government administration, they have promised constitutional reform. Would you um, encourage them to do what you're recommending in a Guyana new election, um, a new constitution? I certainly would. As I said, they almost got it right with um, uh, proportional representation. The only thing that's missing is that once you elect Separation. a government, that government has power over everything and nobody to monitor it. It has to separate that power of legislature from executive. And that's what I would recommend. And that's the great wisdom. Uh, and, and Mr. Pande, um, many Guyanese support what you're saying there. I support that arrangement. And I hope that in, in the new dispensation of Guyana's new constitution, that we will have that in place. Dr. Rose, thank you so much, Mr. Pande. Dr. Rose? My pleasure. Mr. Pande. As Charles mentioned, you've been the fifth prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, but you have been a trade unionist prior to all of this. You were the president of the Trinidad Sugar and General Workers Trade Union. I know most trade unionists, if you go back to the Regarian Trinidad, Bornem and Guyana, Jagan and all of them, they cross over from trade unionism into politics. But what prompted you to enter politics? Uh, when I came back from studying in England, after nine years actually working and studying, I had a scholarship to go to Delhi to do postgraduate work. But at the time when I came back home to Trinidad for that short vacation, the, the opposition was engaged in a struggle against the passing of the Industrial Stabilization Act which they considered to be anti-worker legislation. And I was persuaded to join that struggle. I joined it, gave up my scholarship, and simply plunged headlong, rushing, rushing in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> and that's it. And I spent the rest of my life in Trinidad um, battling with the trade unions. Um, and once you begin to work with the trade unions and they begin to have confidence in you, the chances are they will vote you into political office. This happens naturally. Chedi, Chedi was an example. Okay. You were elected Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago in 1995, and you were the That's first right. Indian Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago at a time when the Blacks were about 54% of the population. Did you get their support? Uh, first of all, when I, when, when I became prime minister and they referred to me as being the first Indian prime minister, I said that I knew of only one Indian prime minister and he was in India. <laughs> um, I was not an Indian prime minister. I, I was a prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago of East Indian descent, which is a different thing. Now, okay. no, you, your second, your answer to the second question. No, I did not get the support of the entire country. No, I couldn't. But I had tremendous support among the Afro Trinidadian community. Otherwise, I would not have been able to win the elections. I had tremendous support. And that support came from uniting them to carry out labor struggles. When we were fighting for better wages and, uh, and working conditions, we didn't care about the color of our skin and our race and so on. We were all workers. And because of that kind of united struggle, I enjoyed uh, quite a lot of support uh, from the workers, basically of uh, Afro-descent. You were also the leader of the Workers and Farmers Party, am I right? I was a founding member, yes. 
would see a large say, gym. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say with CLR James, um, Stephen Bernard, yeah, not, not Robinson, all of them. Um, no, Robinson was not part of that. Um, Robinson was in Tobago at the time. Uh, and, and I got involved with them, as I say, because they were struggling uh, for the poor, the powerless, uh, the workers. And I felt I belonged there. And I began, I joined struggle with them and just continued for the rest of um, my life until I became prime minister when I had to give up my trade union activities. But the workers, the workers and farmers party that you were the founding member of became the most fiercest opposition when you were elected prime minister, calling for the separation of Trinidad and of Tobago from Trinidad. And you were able to patch up those differences. What happened there? I I can't recall the Workers and Farmers Party advocating a, a separation between the two countries. I think what Mr. Robinson was operating on his own at the time, and uh, what he was calling for is greater autonomy. I didn't think he was asking for a separation of, uh, of the two countries, but greater autonomy for Tobago. I think that was his struggle. And he concerned himself totally with that struggle, ignoring everything else that was happening in Trinidad. During your tenure as prime minister from 1995 to 2001, were there any major racial conflicts in the Trinidad between Indo and Afro Trinidadians? No, none whatever. As a matter of fact, we, inter we introduced into the system uh, something called tripartitism. And that is, we made sure that on all the state boards, the unions representing the workers were, were members of the state boards. So that the union knew exactly what management was doing and management had to get support of the union to do what they wanted. So that was the system uh, we introduced. And because of that, we did not have uh, uh, any major labor disturbances. And therefore, very little racial conflict. Of course, the opposition um, would be different. Their job is to remove us and get into parliament. That is the, the political system. And they would carry out the campaign and so on. But that is what is expected of them under the present constitution. You. At the time, I was able to pull up your, 19, your 1995 manifesto, and you, part of your platform was campaigning on unity, how to unite the country, make it stronger, so as to make sure that the oil and gas money goes, gets to the smallest person in society. Did that happen? As a matter of fact, I think it was a Caribbean leader. I think it was the Prime Minister of Jamaica who came to Trinidad and said that oil money was flowing through Trinidad like a dose of salt. I think he meant Epsom salt. Uh, we have earned hundreds of billions of dollars, and today the country is poor. And it is so because of corruption, waste, and mismanagement. And corruption, waste, and mismanagement takes place when the elected government is in control of both the legislature and the executive. In the 2001 election, the part, your party, United Congress, had 18 seats. Patrick Manning, PNM, had 18 seats. An election was forged to call because you refused to allow a speaker to be elected. And you lost yeah. that election. As a matter of fact, yeah. uh, Robinson appointed Manning to be the prime minister. And I was told where you had more, the more popular votes, but still 18 yeah. seats. Did yes, you saw that being unfair? That is correct. Um, and uh, he used all kinds of stupid um, reasons. For example, he said he did it on the basis of moral and spiritual values. 
I don't know who is morals or who is spiritual values, but um, that's a stupid thing. Uh, the point is, I do not know what prompted him to do what was probably a most unconstitutional act. Because under the uh, British system, which we had inherited, and I think it happened uh, with President Heath at one time, where there was a, a tie, and the Queen calls him in and tells him to form a government. And if you cannot form a government, uh, she calls the opposition and say, form the government. But she calls the sitting prime minister. And I was the sitting prime minister. And that uh, what Robinson should have done was to say, Mr. Prime Minister, go ahead, form a government. If you can, he calls on Mr. Bannon and said, okay, come, form a government. And uh, that was the constitutional way to deal with that. But instead, he used all kind of spurious reasons for his own gratification um, to appoint Mr. Manning, who had a minority of votes. Did you ever get a reason why he did that? An answer? Well, one thing I know is that from the time I came to Trinidad and entered the politics, we have always been political opponents. That is, we, when we fought the elections, he would fight in Tobago, we'd fight in Trinidad. He, when he comes to Trinidad or fight in Trinidad, we would be against him uh, and so on. And uh, there is this history of fighting uh, against one another. And I imagine he was still a PNM at heart. Maybe that was the reason why he, he appointed Mr. Manning. But here, here's the thing. When you refuse to allow a speaker to be elected, obviously parliament had to be dissolved and new elections were, had to be called. The polls were showing that if an election is held, the blame will be at your doorstep. And it was also showing that you are going to lose the election. All your senior party members warned you not to go to the polls at this time. Allow Manning to run the country at least a year or two, but you were stubborn enough. You went to the polls and you lost. And after losing that, there were, there were conflicts within the, the UNC and you were kicked out. Uh, I think you have everything a little mixed up. A little, a little mixed up. Uh, first of all, I had no intention of hanging on to a parliament if I could not perform my function of serving the people. So once there was this deadlock and, and uh, a speaker could not be formed, I didn't prevent a speaker from being formed. Manning uh, prevented a, a speaker from being formed. The whole thing was each was voting for its own candidate. So. That was it. But having having done that, all that was left for me to do was to say, okay, since a parliament cannot sit, I won't call parliament. I will let the thing hang in space. That I thought would have been very, very treasonable, if I may use that word, to just hang on to office as the prime minister because I was then, and allowed the country to go to pieces. That's why I called an election. Uh, I called an election because I refused to have a parliament sitting that couldn't function. Charles, over to you. Mr. Pandey, I am glad you mentioned when Dr. Rose said that you were the first Indian Prime Minister of Trinidad, and I like your answer. Because what we have, what, and I, I don't know if we're going to blame the, the white man for this, we're going to blame the West, but we seem to think in the Caribbean, in Trinidad and Guyana, that we are Indians and we are Africans, when in fact we are none of the two. And as you rightly said, we are of Indian descent and we are of African descent. And unless we see it in that con, as you rightly said, they are two different things. If you want, to be an Indian, go to India and you will be an Indian. If you want to be an African, go to Africa and you'll be an African. So do you think um, when Mr. 
Robinson made that decision. Was there any element of racism, you think, in that decision? There probably was. Okay. There probably was. Um, but the point about it is we have not completely been evolved from slavery and indenture. We still have that in our psyche. And that is why we keep referring to ourselves as Indians and Africans. Because we haven't got slavery and, in, and um, uh, indenture out of our system, out of our psychology. We haven't got it. It's still there. That's why we think of ourselves as Indians and Africans. Yeah. And, and I bring up the point a lot of times right here in, you know, in New York, we speak to a Pakistani or a Bengali or a Sri Lankan. They're all from the same root. But you tell a Pakistani he's Indian, he's very upset with you. Or a Bengali, he's Indian. He said, no, no, I am Bengali or I'm Pakistani. And people said, oh, it's a different context. It's not. It's the same thing. They, they belong to a country and they identify with their country. But that's a different story. Mr. Pandey. That's, a, uh, that, that, that's the tragedy of nationalism. So yeah. They are nationals of one country, even though they probably came from the same roots and so on. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I'm sorry to disturb you. So at, when you were prime minister, you just made a case for a new constitution to have a new a parliament separate from the executive. Why did you not do that in Trinidad when you were prime minister? In order to amend the constitution, the, the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, one needs a two thirds and a three quarters majority of the members of the House. There were only three prime ministers who had that kind of majority. Dr. Eric Williams, uh, Aaron R. Robinson, and Mrs. Campbell Passat Bissessa. And neither of them wanted constitutional reform. They preferred the racial uh, struggle going on. It's easier to fight elections, I imagine. But does your constitution allow you to have a referendum like Mr. Burnham had in Guyana? Before we had an independence constitution, in 1978, we had a referendum that preempted the 1980 constitution. Couldn't Trinidad go to the people in a referendum to say, we need a new constitution? Um, who would conduct that referendum? Who would agree to that referendum? It will, in order to be official, it will have to be the government. Right, and you are the prime minister. No. Uh, I'm talking about you when you were prime minister. Oh, I see, I see. It would have meant changing the laws to give it effect. Otherwise, what effect it would have? If I said, okay, we are having a referendum, on what basis? What legal basis? There'll be no legal basis for it at all. It just would be. Uh, political uh, campaigning. Uh, in order to call a genuine referendum, it must be part of the Constitution to have any effect. Yeah, but I'm talking about preempting the Constitution. What Mr. Burnham did in Guyana is that the Parliament approved to have a, um, by, simple, by simple majority, to have a referendum, and then the people in Guyana voted for the referendum. But you, in the, when you were prime minister, your your party had the most seat in parliament. Yes. So you could have yes. you could have passed a bill to have a referendum, couldn't you? I never thought of it. Um, I don't know if it would have had any legal effect, but I never yes. thought of it. I. Okay. That's All my right. answer. Okay, no problem, Mr. Pandey. Um, let's get to the real crux of the matter. Um, do you believe there is a racial problem among Af people of African origin and Indian origin, or is there a mistrust among our people? I say that because I, I want to mention this. We play games together, we parties together, we eat together, we visit each other's home, you know, we marry each other. We do all these things, but when it comes to politics, the African, I mean, the Guyanese of African descent, Trinidad and Guyana, want to have a, a leader in, of their choice, of, of, that look like them. The people of Indian descent want the same thing. 
So is there a racial problem or is it a, is it a problem of trust that African in descent don't trust the people of Indian descent and vice versa? It's a question of power. That's what it is. The Indians, uh, the Indians Uh, leaders organize their parties around the uh, Indians and the African uh, African leaders uh, uh, organize their parties among Africans. It is power, and it is power by this elite that uses the the, the differences between the races, not for the benefit of the race, but for the benefit of themselves, for power. And that is what is happening. That is why uh, they can't unite. Neither the government of Trinidad and Tobago nor the opposition has ever wanted constitutional reform. The people, um, the, sorry. Go on, go on. Sorry, you go on. Uh, they, they prefer the racial voting. It's easier. You don't have to fight too hard. And Each side is saying, if we get into power, you will be all right. And the other side says, if we get into power, you will be all right. And they, they mislead the races because once, once they get into power, the only people who are all right are themselves. <laughs> and, and we have the same problem, Guyana, as well, yeah. because um, I don't believe, even though the PNC and the PEP talks about cultural reform, and we will test it this time around, um, they really don't want no transformative effect. They prefer to have that racial voting. And yeah. in, the case, in the case of Guyana, the person, the party with the most votes win the presidency, so that's strengthening the racial voting because if the African Guyanese say they vote in a block, their candidate will win. If the Indian Guyanese vote in a block, they say their candidate will win. And that is what kept us down all the time. So we have that problem. Now, how do we overcome that problem, Mr. Pandey? The only way to overcome that problem is to change the constitution. Now, you know what I fear? I have seen that the that history is replete with examples of when the people desire, desperately desire the need for change and they do not get it peacefully, they resort to getting it violently. That is my fear. And, uh, and, and if we do not amend the constitution peacefully, peacefully, it will be amended violently. That's my view. And be a tragedy for, for societies such as Ghana and Trinidad, where, as you know, when you have that um, problem with the killing of Of, uh, the races of one another. That is what happens. The political struggle de degenerates into a racial struggle. You never had, I think the people of Trinidad and Tobago did not go through that period of racial violence that Guyana had. No, we um, have not. Right. Do you see that happening in Trinidad anytime? I mean, is that a what fear I in Trinidad? See, what I see happening in Trinidad is that the society is thinking. Every day it's getting worse and worse. Despite all the millions and billions of dollars we have, we today are borrowing money in order to run the country. Now, people are getting fed up of that. Uh, in Trinidad, there was, there, and now demonstrations have been prohibited because of the uh, coronavirus thing. As soon as that is over, I believe there's going to be dead demonstrations all over the place. Demanding change. But not in a violent way. You don't see Trinidad erupting into violence with the ethnic groups or so. You see, do you see the people in Trinidad yeah. working together for change? I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't get that. Do you see the people of Trinidad working together for change that will make their society a better society, a better country? Okay. There are three dimensions to this. One, there are those who vote for the the PNM, the government. And there are those who vote for the opposition. Do you know that less than 50% of the electorate vote for both of them put together? If anyone had the 
charisma, the courage to mobilize that other 50% into a political party, into a political organization uh, to win a majority in the House. That, that is the only other peaceful way I see that the Constitution can be amended. Is there anyone in China take up that challenge? I don't know. You don't see that happening. Okay, Mr. Pandey, we'll take a short commercial break, and when we come back, we'll continue this discussion. Great discussion. It's the gifting time of the year, and send your loved one a special gift. Choose from these special gift boxes. Select a four-meal box as a gift, or one of our preset boxes, such as the duck and roti box, or a doubles box. We also sell pastry gift boxes and roti gift boxes as well, and much more on allfromonesupplier.com. There's a gift box for everyone, even GT boxes and TNT boxes. Select your gift box and let us ship to your loved ones today. Log on to allformonesupplier.com. This is a save the date announcement. Couples, family, relatives, and friends, save the date. We are taking our culture, music, and food on our vacation in 2022. Enjoy a vacation plus special events and entertainments. Here are the choices. Guyana Excursion May 4th to May 11th. Indian Talent Competition July 14th to July 18th in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Christian Community Week July 21st to July 25th in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Curry Duck Curry Competition July 28th to August 1st in Cancun, Mexico. Caribbean Week August 4th to August 8th in Punta Cana, Dominican Republic. Battle for the DJ Crown, Soka, Indo, and Chutney Style, August 11th to August 15th. Enjoy five days plus four nights, all-inclusive vacation, with your own cultural music, food, and entertainment. Meet and greet sessions with the performers and competition prizes. First place prize, $2,000. Second place, $1,500. And third place, $1,000. This is a save the date announcement by Travel Span. More information will become available in December. Travel Span, always on the cutting edge and serving you for over 27 years. Call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. Folks, the Ness Restaurant is the place to dine for Guyanese and Caribbean dishes. It is the best restaurant in Queens. The staff is courteous and Dave, the owner, is always there to welcome you. So for a memorable dining experience, visit the Ness Restaurant located at 12717 101 Avenue, South Richmond Hill. Go and make a reservation today or take out. Call 718-847-4035. Dave West Indian Products is the only distributor of 100% authentic West Indian products. Dave West Indian supplies fish, vegetables, curry, spices, sodas, and coconut water, plus ghees, and much more straight from Guyana and the Caribbean. For all your shopping needs, visit Dave's Guyana Fish and Grocery Market. Dave West Indian Products are also available in West Indian stores, Key Food, and allforonesupplier.com. Dave West Indian has a full line of the most desirable products to fit all your needs. So visit Dave Guyana Fish and Grocery Market on 118th Street on Liberty Avenue or in Maryland at 7505 New Hampshire Ave or any West Indian stores or allfromonesupplier.com. Dave West Indian, your 100% authentic West Indian product. Welcome back to all our global listeners. Here we have tonight with us is Mr. Basdir Pandey former Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Mr. Pandey, it was said, and I don't know how accurate it is, that when Trinidad was about to become a republic, you were not too favorable to that. Is that true? You are, I, I don't know exactly what you're asking. All I can tell you is that um, when Dr. Williams changed the Constitution to make Trinidad a republic. It was a mere form, a change of form, not of substance. He kept the Westminster model. The only the name change. And therefore, I would have been against something like that, yes. 
No, I was what I read is that you, you were, you were, it was it's a hybrid, meaning that it was partly parliamentary system, partly Republican system, because that's the president. But you were forming against that. You wanted either all out Republican or remain a parliamentary system, Westminster model. No, what I wanted was a change of the Westminster model. That's what I want. We inherited the Westminster model, and it's not working for us. And merely to change the name of, of, of the country to say we are now a republic, a republic country. Uh, we are a republic without changing the essence and without changing the form is an exercise in futility. Guyana is a republic, and it's a full-fledged republic where you have an executive president and a prime minister below him. Is that the system you wanted in Trinidad? No, not quite. Because the, the executive power and the legislative power in Guyana is in the same hands, same group of people. That you have got to change. You have to have a separation of powers. And that's the only way out for us. OK. Now, you mentioned something which caught me, caught my eyes and my ears. You said when a country is racially divided, it's easier for the politicians to campaign on race in order to win an election. Why would you say that? Because it happens. Simple. That's what they do. They don't have to put forward policy. They just make promises. We will do this for you, and we'll do that for you. On the other side, says, don't worry, then we'll do this for you, and we'll do that for you. And that's how they carry on. And in the, and in the end, Whoever wins does only for themselves, not for anybody else. So do you think that's the situation in Ghana right now? I don't know what obtains in Ghana. I'd, lo uh, I'd love to find out what is happening there at the moment. Well, th we have the Indo and afro Guyanese, And the country is vastly divided between those two races. There's yeah. absolutely no unity among them. A politically, sure. I'm, talk politically I'm talking about. So what you're saying, it's easier for the Indian politician campaign based on to get their constituents and the blacks to get their constituents. It's easier for them to do that or they should campaign for an inclusive government based on unity. Uh, they must want it. But you see, the present system suits the present rulers. And they don't want it. First, they must want it. And if they want it, yes, it can be done. Yes, it can change. But, okay. you, but, in, 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 but in Ghana, uh, again, the problem is one of demographics. With the, the Ghanese of Afro descent living uh, in one area and the um, Ghanese of Indian descent living in another area. And so racial politics suits them. Choose the, the, the politicians. That's that's I that that is something that I never realized. Okay, now, do you think a third party stand a chance in Trinidad? Sorry. Do you think a third party will stand a chance of gaining the balance of power in Trinidad? No. Not under the present system of first past the post. First past the post single member constituency. No. What do you need? You want a proportional representation system? Proportional representation for the parliament. And the parliament must be a purely legislative body supervising the work of the executive body, which is a separate uh, entity. It must not be the same entity as the as the, the the government in parliament. So you're that saying is, that there should not be ministers in parliament? No, no, no member of parliament should be a minister. Where that system exists, though? I beg one. Where that system exists? I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. I could tell you what is suitable to us, as I told you before. We may look at others, um, for, for, for example, but we have to devise a constitution which is relevant to our own historical antecedents. Not okay. anybody else's. 
No. So why do we say, where is that happening now? I don't know. And it doesn't matter. Is it relevant to us? That is what matters. Let me, let me get to the economic aspect of it. Trinidad was one of the most developed countries, and I still think is in the Caribbean because of its oil wealth and so forth. But today, most of that oil wealth has dissipated. And the country is running at the, one of the highest inflation rates right now. Plus, right. its economy, it's about the lowest among the four major Caribbean countries, Guyana, right. Trinidad, Barbados, and Jamaica. Sure. Do you think that Trinidad will be able to come back, even though there's an increase in oil? With the present political um, system, the answer is no. And secondly, with the accent on global warming and that sort of thing, oil is likely to become less profitable than it was before. So that we shall have to find other means of earning a living. The UNC has served one term. Well, you had a second election, but six years is just like, like one term and two years. Under Mrs. Bissessar, she serves one term as well. Why is it the UNC can maintain power to win re-elections? Why what? Why is it that the ANC cannot win re-election? Like the ANC? ANC? The ANC? The UNC. Uh, uh, why they can't win it? A second term. They can't win it because of the racial divide in the country. And unless the electors decide to unite behind one party, and they won't, given the racial um, cleavages of the country, that won't happen. But do you think in the latter two years of Mistress Bissessar's prime ministerial position, she, it was massive corruption being exposed almost on a daily basis? Do you think she was incapable of curbing the massive corrupt practices under her government? Incapable of doing what? Do you think that she was incapable of solving the co massive corruption practices that were taking place under her government? Well, what we did was, oil, when we came into office, oil was floating between 8 and $15 a barrel. And um, no country has all the resources to satisfy all the wants. There are unlimited wants and the unlimited resources. So what you do in a situation like that is you create what is called an order of priority. And we put uh, at the top of the list crime and unemployment. And we brought crime down to the lowest had been in 20 years. Unemployment to the highest had been in 30, 30 years. And uh, we build schools to educate our people so that they can be qualified for jobs, so that they will be unemployed, so that they won't have to rob. So we had a vision of the society. And we worked towards that vision, given on, on the extent of our natural resource, or of our financial resources. How do you think Dr. Raleigh doing right now? He thinks he's doing well. What do you think? He's yeah, doing too well. <laughs> he's in, he's in trouble. A lot of dissatisfaction in this society. Charles, over to you. Mr. Prime Minister, um, when you were minister, when you were Prime Minister, you wrote off a couple hundred million in debt that Guyana owed Trinidad and Tobago. 300 there, billion. 300 million US dollars. There were some rumors that you should have negotiated Guyana to get some of Guyana's land. Was, was the right of the debt pinned to any um, Guyana's resource that Trinidad would have received? Did you hear me? Mr. Pandey? But secondly, it was a loan, uh, monies that were given. And uh, the 
situation, the economic situation in Guyana was so bad that they could not repay that loan. And they were unlikely to be able to repay it in the future. And I thought that was a, they were carrying a burden uselessly. And so we wrote it off. It was as simple as that. Um, no, that? I did not think. I did not think of extracting my pound of flesh by um, taking Guyana's land. No, I did not think so. In retrospect, do you think Guyana owes Trinidad anything for the debt write-off that Trinidad gave to Guyana? Well, yeah, well, they don't uh, legally, officially, and so on. No, they don't owe anything for that debt. That was written off. Okay. I don't know if you, um, when was the last time you went to Guyana, Mr. Pandey? A couple of years ago. Okay. Oh, I, I, I went there at the invitation of the wedding of um, uh, the daughter of the guy who sings, what's his name? Um, Eddie, Eddie Grant? No, no. Uh, Indo Ghanese. Oh, I, I don't There's know. There's quite a bit of them who sing, I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah, well, that was. I forgot the name. But it's a couple of years ago. Okay. If you go to Ghana now, Mr. Pandey, you will see a lot of white people in the streets of Georgetown. Yes. Guyana, Guyana has been recolonized. And as we speak, there is racial animosity. As I said before, that the, the people of African descent thinks that. Their leader should be the president. The people of Indian descent believe that their people should be the president. And that dragging of our resource, Trinidad and Tobago had tremendous revenue from your oil resource. We are not likely to get that kind of revenue because of the contract that was signed by the prior government, but Mr. Um, you know, during the Grange administration. Do you think Guyana has been recolonized and these people are taking advantage of us? I don't know if recolonization is the word, but once you have money, you have the international conglomerates trying to exploit it and get as much of it as they can. And that is what is taking place. It's an international system. But don't you think our politicians are smart enough to deal with these people for the for the benefit of the Guyanese people or like the Trinidadian? I mean, are are is our politicians to the standard, in your opinion, to ensure that they get the best for the people of their country? Shouldn't the politicians do that? Um, those who want to exploit your country for its wealth foreigners that is they'll keep you divided they'll keep you divided so that you do not have the strength to deal with them our strength fades away by fighting each other that's right the divide and rule the divide and rule philosophy of the british has been that for centuries as a politician mr pandey do you believe that these conglomerates, these Anglo-Saxons, these you know, these people overseas, are they are they do they have our politicians in their pocket? I mean, do they do they control our politicians in your view? Ah, uh, yeah, yes, they have to. Otherwise, they wouldn't get um, what they want. And in return, what do politicians get? Do you really want me to answer that question? I would love to. You're, you're the lone man standing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You want to try answer I didn't it? Know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> so do you believe that um, our politicians crumble too quickly? Sometimes they have very little choice if they want to stay in power. If they want to stay in power um, and the conglomerates decide not to back them, as indeed has happened in Venezuela, um, they'd be out. So that in order to survive, they usually succumb to the international lobby. Recently, Mr. Pandey, in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, with the 
not so with the gas pipeline and the gas situation there, Trinidad was able to renegotiate the contract that they have that entered into with, I believe it was the, the Japanese, I'm not sure. Do you recall that um, happening recently in Trinidad? Um, I wasn't following it up. Uh, but I know that there was some kind of uh, negotiations going on. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure what the nature was, whether it was for uh, the driven rights or what were the terms and conditions of the negotiation. No, I, I, I am not okay with that. Um, well, I'm saying that because currently the government of Guyana is saying that there is sanctity in the contract with Exxon and they cannot renegotiate it. Do you believe that? Well, I do. well if you enter into a contract that says it cannot be uh, negotiated, renegotiated, if you do, you are breaking the contract and you could be sued internationally for it. But the contract also says that the, you can change the contract if both sides agree. So okay. if the government of Guyana indicate to Exxon, listen, we would like to sit down to look back at this contract. It's now beholding on Exxon to say yes or no. Why well, do you think the government well, I, of Guyana is not asking for that? Well, I don't know, but Exxon may say, okay, if, if we have a contract that says it cannot be renegotiated, and then you want to talk about it, well, we are prepared to sit down and talk to you about it. And if Exxon agrees that to renegotiate, they renegotiate. If Exxon agrees not to renegotiate, you cannot um, do anything about it. Otherwise, it will be a breach of contract and you'll be subject to international law. That is true. That is correct. But except the world has now changed as well with social media and with all these pressure groups. But if Guyana government indicate to Exxon that we need to sit down, this contract is lopsided, and Exxon says no, I think the Guyanese government will have tremendous support from people around the world to pressure Exxon to get into that negotiation table. I don't know. And uh, the, the, the thing is, they could sit down. They will have no objection to sitting down. And they'll sit down for a year, two years, three years, four years, it doesn't matter. They'll sit down. And if they say, okay, we are sitting down and we are talking, they'll talk forever if they wish. But they'll only agree to renegotiate if, they, if it is in their interest so to do. If it is not in their interest so to do, my view is they won't. But we have leverage because every time a new pipeline, a new well is, is to be um, used for extraction of oil, they need to get permit from the government of Guyana to do it. So if the government refused to give the permit, they cannot do it. So we do have tools to renegotiate with them. Oh, well, it should be used. <laughs> if it is I, legal. Yeah, yeah it, I know, that's in the contract. It's, it's the EPA need to give permission, the government of Guyana need to give permission, and still it seems to to me, our government don't seem inclined to renegotiate. Someone wrote a beautiful article the other day, uh, Mr. Pandey, in the paper, saying that if the people, to the people of Guyana, that if you want to get increase your salary, we need to get more revenue from our oil. Oil, as you know, has the largest, greatest area for revenue generation of all our resources right now. And if we are getting a pittance, it will not help us to develop as Trinidad did or other oil producing countries where they have a bigger share of their oil revenue. Um, Dr. Rose? Okay, Mr. Pandey. Now, you were in association with one gentleman, Lloyd Best. You know that name? Yes. Yes, Mr. Lloyd Best, I know. Yes, I knew him very well. Okay. And he died a few years ago, but yeah. he, he had written an article then and said that the future of Trinidad looks bleak. What do you have to say about that? I think it is bleaker now than when he wrote. Why is that so? 
because we deteriorated them. We're borrowing money to run the country. And, it is, and we are borrowing very heavily. And that will be a burden upon not only this generation, but several generations to come. That can't be a, a happy state to be in. Lloyd was right. Okay. Now, you let me go back to something here. You were elected in 1995, after almost three decades of PNM rule. I think with some mind interruptions in between. When you became pres prime minister, did you act vindictively against any former ministers, PNM ministers in the government? None whatever. As a matter of fact, I commend myself for not having a spiteful bone in my body. I have a job to do. I do it to the best of my ability, regardless of the consequences. I do what I believe to be right, even if later on it may be proved to be wrong. I cannot do less than what I believe to be right. And so I did what I believe to be right. I, well, never, victim, I never victimized a single member of the, uh, the government. Not a single member. Not one can uh, claim that way. Did any information surface that the former ministers, PNM ministers of the government, misused their office? I, I didn't get that. Did any information surface that former ministers in the PNM government misused their office? Or abuse their office? I'm not I'm aware. I'm not aware of that. Yeah. No, uh, no, no, no. To... When, when, when you became prime minister, the PNM ministers prior to you becoming prime minister, were there any report of them being corrupt or they misused their office that you did not take action on? As I said, the most important thing for a leader is his people. So think about your people first. And this, the crime was at an extremely high rate. Unemployment, a very high rate. Uh, the, the utilities were not functioning and so on. And the welfare, the immediate welfare of the people was the most important thing. And that is what I address myself to. Everything else took second place. I say that to bring you to this here. In Guyana currently, the PP the government has been there for the past, I think, year and five months. And they have charged ministers in the government for misuse in office. Recently, it was just in last week. They are actually about to lay charges of the, minister, the foreign minister of finance and so forth. And they have charged a number of other senior government officials. Do you think that going, they're barking over the right track or they're doing something that is wrong? Well, first of all, the law must be obeyed. And if there's been a breach of law, I think it is the function of the government to deal with it. It is a breach of law. But people are innocent until they're proven guilty. But if someone has committed a breach of the law and the government has the wherewithal to deal with it, they should deal with it. As a matter of fact, whether they were a minister or not, you should deal with all breaches of the law. Okay. Now, let me go back to something again. When Mr. Dr. Rowley took office, he said that he will govern in the interest of all Trinidadians. And he will not, he's not concerned with who belongs to what party or the ethnicity or nothing of the sort. Do you think that is happening in Trinidad right now? Of course not. The society doesn't feel that way. The society is divided. It feels discriminated against. It feels alienated. All kinds of um, hang-ups we have in this society. And I don't think has, he has been able to deal with the problem of a, the feeling of alienation. I don't think he has succeeded in doing that. Okay. Caribbean Airlines, during your time, it was British Western Airlines as almost always we're running at a loss. Even though it's being given free oil at the time from the Trinidad government. And all governments have propped up Caribbean Airlines, which has now become the vanguard airline for the Caribbean. Why? 
Well, countries, I imagine, like to know they have their own airlines so that they can uh, serve their people in traveling distances and so on. And that is why they, they subsidize it and they um, bolster it. But the most important thing is, if they are doing that, they must do it without corruption. If there is no corruption, waste, and mismanagement, then there is nothing wrong in having an airline. So long there is no corruption, waste, and mismanagement. Now, you spoke about corruption. Are you aware that under the UNC, when Kamala Bissessor was in office, it was seen as the most corrupt party in all of the Caribbean at the time? Yes, it was. And I think there is an international organization that deals with the level of corruption. And it did um, make that remark that you're referring to. But that's your party. No, sir. My party was the one that ran the government. <laughs> From 1995 to 2001. That was my party. But is this same UNC? Yes. Uh, they retain the name, but it's not the same party. Do you think that she will be re-elected Prime Minister again? In Trinidad, anything could happen. The society is so corrupt, that anything could happen. Um, one does not know. Mr. Rowley, Dr. Rowley appears to be quite unpopular these days, and it's because of the series of problems that are taking place in the society. Problem of unemployment, problem of crime, problem of um, the, the virus, and so on and so forth. But one does not know how, how things will change. Uh, the opposition does not seem to indicate that it has the will to govern, that it has a plan for the, uh, on how to govern the country. They have not enunciated any. In Parliament, they do not put forward alternative um, proposals and so on. Which is that, the fun uh, Sorry. Do you think that Mr. Zizisar should be replaced with a younger leader? Who, oh, Mr. Sir? Mr. Sar. Should be replaced as a younger leader in, in the UNC? That's for the UNC to decide, not me, brother. <laughs> Charles, over to you. Uh, Mr. Pandey, did, does Ms. Bessesar ever come to you for consultation? No, as a matter of fact, after the, she won the elections, I approached her. I went to her house, actually. And I offered, I said, I'm here, and if there is anything I can do, please, I'm willing to, to do so. Let me know what. And she, re, she got me and refused. So I, she did. I did offer. You did offer. In Guyana, we have, we have, we had on this program the former prime minister, Mr. Hamilton Green, and also uh, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran who was former Speaker of the National Assembly. We asked them if they can come together to unite our youths, to bring them together for the benefit of the country. I know you're 88 years old, but will you take on that responsibility to work with an opposing part, someone of African descent or wherever, to bring the youths? Because it appears as to, to me that in Trinidad, there's a lot of gang warfare going on with the youths. Can you work to get the youths to get in Trinidad for the betterment of the country? I think the, the future of Trinidad and Tobago belongs to the youths. Right. I think what is required, our youths are full of energy. They are qualified, they are determined and so on. But they do not participate in the political process because they don't want to be part of this racial divide at, uh, at the time of elections. and. Um, I believe if there is someone who can mobilize the youth to move forward with the energy and vibe that they have, but supported by the older ones like us, 
who have the experience. Because when you say, let us put the youth forward, they say they don't have experience. And when you say, let us put the old fellows forward, they say, them fellows pass it. Why can't we combine the two? Put the youth forward, backed up by the tremendous experience that we who have been there for years have been able to accumulate. That is a possible solution for Trinidad and Tobago. But will you take on the challenge to do that for the children of Trinidad and Tobago? I, I certainly will, and I argue all, all day, every, day, every day for it. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Pandey, I, I lecture at your college here in New York, and a few years ago I was told um, that you went to your culture function and you sang the Hanuman Chalisa in full. Is that yes. correct? That is correct. And I'll tell you what happened. Um, out of every action, there is a re reaction. You know how I managed to learn the Hanuman Chalisa by heart? I had open heart surgery. As Prime Minister, I had open heart surgery. And when I came back, the doctor said I must exercise. But the Prime Minister's residence um, was enclosed with little passages, walkways, and so on. So I had to exercise. And I thought exercise was boring. So I would take the Hanuman Chalisa and read it while I was exercising because there were no Murakas to knock me down and so on. And I would read it over and over and over until I eventually um, uh, were able to recite the 41 verses by heart. Can you still do so that? Out of, uh, out of my, yeah, out of my operation, the, the soundness of my operation became something good. Excellent. Do you still remember it or you have to look at the book oh, I now? Oh, I do. I do remember it, yes. Oh, that's very nice. Um, Mr. Pandey, again, we, you're one, uh, we, as you start the program, you're one of the long-standing politicians of yonder. And before you go to the, you know, in the sunset, there's still much more that you can offer to countries like Trinidad, countries like Guyana. What will be some of the concrete suggestions? I know you talk about an independent parliament and so on, but what else can a, what other system we need to put in place to ensure that the, the people of the country gets the best resources that is available in their country for themselves? Okay, first of all, the government must decide that. They have all the knowledge, they have all the information, they have all the data, and they must know what they want as the best for the country. I'm willing to assist in any way I can in order to help them to do that. No, I'm sure the government have the knowledge and so, but what would you recommend that some of the things that they should do to let the people benefit from the resource of their country? I will be able to look at it if they ask, of course. You must first ask. Um, you shouldn't interfere in people's business um, uh, <laughs> necessarily. So that um, if they ask, I will certainly think about it and give whatever advice I can. Okay. And are you traveling around now, Mr. Pandey, or are you just taking train that? No, not at all. First of all, because of the, uh, the virus, uh, I, I'm on lockdown, actually, and I hardly go anywhere. Um, I haven't traveled for more than a year and a half, I think. Okay, uh, okay. All right, Dr. Rosen, we've got a couple of yeah. minutes more. Okay. Mr. Pandey, you were elected in 1995 yeah. at the time when Chedi Jagan was the president of Guyana. Then he died in 97 and his wife became the president. And eventually, before 2001, you had another president, Barrett Jack Dale. Were you close, who were you closest to at the time? Well, Chedi and I were very close for several reasons, because um, our trajectory was the same. That is to say, we were both professionals. We both worked with, uh, with the workers in the sugar industry. As a matter of fact, we used to exchange notes. You'd come to Trinidad and um, uh, try to help me with my, my own. Uh, problems and so on, advise me. And I'd go to Guyana sometimes and do the same. 
And we had a tremendous relationship because our, our trajectory was the same. Both professionals, both uh, labor leaders, both in the sugar industry and that sort of thing. Um, I have not been able to cultivate that kind of relationship with our president, Shadil. For the reason that I, 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 I was almost out of the uh, politics by that time. Okay. Now, you know, in the Caribbean, we have a no number of new elected leaders. And you being the elder states person, what do you think of Mia Motley's role in Trinidad in, Bar in Barbados? I think you are laying the foundation for me not to be able to travel to Barbados. <laughs> <laughs> and I refuse to let you just so commit me. <laughs> well, Mr. Pandey, um, do you think that the Americans and the British treated Cherry Jagan unfairly when when they allow when they allow Burnham to rig the the election in Guyana? Rigging of any elections is unfair. So no, do you think that the British and the Americans treated Dr. Jagan very unfairly? Um, well, fairness is a relative term. They regarded his, uh, him as being socialist, communist, and um, the international situation was divided between East and West and so on. And so that they wouldn't let him function properly because that would be against their interests. So of course they treated him unfairly. But you think it was a mistake for Dr. Jagan to go that the eastern route, knowing that the world was divided in east and west, in, in, in retrospect, was that a good thing for him or he should have avoided that? Uh, that would be a bad matter for him as well. A man cannot do and ought not to do anything other than what he believes to be right. And he must pay the consequences for it. Shadi was the most honest, dedicated, loyal. I loved him. Uh, and he did what he believed to be right for his country. How can I condemn him for that? I can't. No, no, we're not condemning him, but we are saying that the, the Americans um, and the British treated him unfairly. Because if Guyana did not have rigged election, I believe Guyana would have been a very prosperous nation today. Well, yep, you're probably right. You uh -huh. have tremendous resources. Have you met Forbes Burnham? Sorry? Have you met Forbes Burnham? No, I don't think I did. Okay. Okay. Now, my question, another question to you is this. You said you don't want to say anything about Mia Martin and Barbados. Or any other leader in the Caribbean, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you offer to the government of Guyana? In a country that is, what advice would you offer to the government of Guyana in a country that is racially divided like in Trinidad? Amend the constitution if they can. Um, I struggle for amending the constitution so that the constitution contains those two principles that I mentioned a separation of the legislature from the executive. That's the only advice I give, the same one I give for my own country. And what about governance? Yeah, doctor? What, what advice would you give them on governance? On? On how governance. to govern. So, sorry? On how to govern the country. How to govern the country? Yeah. You me? Tell the Guyanese government <laughs> how to run not, the country? As, a, as, an, el, as, an, elder state, as an elder statesman. I, I feel you intend to get me in trouble no matter how hard you try, I will not let you. We tell the guy who's going to have to run that country. I, I can't do that. So, <laughs> you can offer an advice? Unsolicited, unsolicited advice is hardly ever taken. <laughs> so, so, your recommendation, and, and Mr. Pandey, I really support what you're saying. I like that. I've been advocating that all the time, that guy, Guyana, like Trinidad, or should Trinidad, Guyana, we should have an independent parliament, independent of the government, 
and then we have the judiciary. We always talk about the Westminster three arms of government, but two of the arm is the same. The executive and the and the legislature is the same arm, basically. That's right. That's right. And then the executive appoints the, 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 the judiciary. So, you know, they have, you know, it's, so I'm not sure, but it's three arm they talk about. Total control. Yeah. The, the, the Westminster system, as it operates in countries like ours, give the government total control over everything. And that's not and good that's, for a country. That's why we can't prosper. That's why we have billions of dollars that run through the country like a dose of Epsom salts. What you're advocating is, is a system like the United States where Congress, there are no members of the cabinet that are part of Congress. They elect their own independent people to govern the country, even though parties align with whichever president is in office, it's still, they, they exert their independence whenever they want to. So that's the system you're advocating. There he goes again, trying to get me to advise the American government how to run their country. <laughs> the Americans have their own problems, they have their own history, they have their own historical antecedents, they have a, and they, they try to evolve a constitution that is suited to them. How can I interfere with that? Okay, well, I'm let, me, the same okay let me ask you this question. Myself. What do you think of CARICOM? CARICOM? Yeah. I think it's, it, it, it has by and large been a failure. Why? And it has been a failure because, first of all, they can't unite. That's the first thing. One from ten leaves north, I believe, um, was the Eric statement Willem, of Eric the president. said that. Yes. So they can't unite. So but that was the Federation, the West East Federation, not CARICOM. Or, Car or CARICOM. No, uh, no, he said Car it, he said it for okay. the West East Federation when Jamaica You're pulled right. out. You're right. I'm sorry. Uh, the failure of CARICOM is that they all produce the same thing. And therefore, trading between them is not really significant. We import most of the things in all the Caribbean countries. We import it from abroad. We don't produce them. Uh, and we don't produce them because maybe uh, uh, the, the way we were brought up, the result of uh, slavery and colonialism that taught us to um, work for the master rather than become the master. That's a big, that's our problem. So you're saying that what that Jamaican pastor said, and he was the, I forgot his name now, that CARICOM is a social club. Yes. Yes. It hasn't really made much improvement for the peoples of the Caribbean, has it? For all the years that it has existed. And it, it, it is because we can't get together to produce things which we export. We but they have, they have free trade, they have free movement of people. Those things are not good. Didn't work, hasn't worked. They have free yeah, trade. Yeah, they are, they are all competing for tourism. All of them, every Caribbean country is competing for tourism. How, how, how can they become an economic union in that sense? They have to have joint production. They have to get together to be able to produce things that they can export so that they get the necessary um, uh, for an exchange to do what they want with it. But we cannot get together as a unit of production. But I think, Mr. Pandey, President Ali did make that announcement yesterday, I believe when he's calling on CARICOM to really live up to the expectation of CARICOM, because as you rightly said, CARICOM has not specialized, the different countries do not specialize in what they can do best to maximize the efficiency and profitability of the, of the region. So we're competing with each other. Even Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Pandey, you're importing sugar from Guatemala rather than Guyana sugar. No, no, which is, no, 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 no. I thought we were, you're just giving me a political weapon that I didn't know. I thought we were importing sugar from um, uh, Guyana. Oh, it's Ghana or Guyana? Guyana. No, no not all of it. Very little of, of trade sugar comes from Guyana. A lot of it comes from 
from Guatemala. Really? I didn't know that. And there we are. Ghana produces rice. But we import rice. From the so USA? Is, yeah. We import rice from the USA. How, how can CARICOM survive under these conditions? And uh, most, of, most of the things that we could grow here, we, we import. Because we can't get together as a unit, as a productive unit. That is our problem. We have to become a productive unit. Mr. Pandey, our time is coming to an end. We have to wrap up now. But I hope that CARICOM, my wish is CARICOM, use you to talk to our leaders to get this united front for CARICOM. As we already said, it's a talking shop. It's a social club. The people of the region do not benefit from that union, which we expected to happen many, many years ago. Mr. Pandey, thank you so much for being the program tonight. Do you want to say anything in closing? No, thank you for inviting me. And um, how is my friend Dohar? He's, He's doing fine. very well. Yeah. Doing great. Please, please give him my fondest regards. Both of him and family. We will. You definitely do that. Dr. Rose, anything in closing? Yes, I am again going to call on the government to make sure that all its offices are open during lunch hours. And also to make sure that public servants answer the telephones and return phone calls. They do not do that. I would also call it yes. to have a better Wi-Fi system because there's always a breakdown in the midst of communication. And also to increase the retirement age from 55 to 60 years. The reason for that is when you retire 55, you don't get your NIS pension until you reach 60. So what will happen to you during those five years? So they should increase it to 60 years. It's about time this government put these things in place and make a move. If Guyana is going to be developed, you got to start from what exists and not maintain the status quo. Change what exists and make sure it works in the interest of all the people. That's my beat. The simplest one. They wouldn't answer their phone. And we can't even correct that. We can't even correct the fact that I know. people will answer, people the, servants will answer their phone. What can we do? If you can't even correct that. When the public servant tells me, when the public servant tells me that he or she is going to call me back, I said, now you tell me a blatant lie. You don't call back anybody. 90% of them don't call back people. Yes. Management. And why the management? Because we have a government that controls everything, including the apartment of people. You know, so. and, and in the private sector, the call is returned almost immediately. And that's just different between government exactly. and the private sector. That's right. I'd also like to tell the government that they have to reduce the maternal deaths. There are too many maternal deaths in these modern times. Have qualified doctors and nurses to make sure that maternal deaths are at its minimum. I agree with you. The whole education system is still geared to a colonial system. Still True. geared. True. Yeah, we still do geography based on the Great Lakes and all the American things rather than the Caribbean and so on. So you're right, but we have not been able to change that yet. Mr. Pandey, we want to thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward for you to be with us for many, many more years ahead and for, for you to come again sometime in the program so we can discuss issues that affect us in Guyana and, of course, in Trinidad and Tobago as well. But make your sure humble, when you, your humble servant is at your service. But <laughs> make sure when you come back, you're prepared to ask the questions on Barbados and the other Caribbean countries. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, so, I want to talk to you All a minute right. after, the, after the program. Well, thank you so much to our audience. We want to thank our sponsors. We want to thank you, Noor Singh, and to Devin, and to everyone else. Take care. God bless you until we meet again next Monday.